All right, you guys, welcome back to another lesson. Uh, this lesson here is going to be a lesson that's near and dear to my heart for a few different reasons, and that is to talk about the complex world of traumatic brain injury. So there's a lot of stuff to talk about with this topic, so make sure you guys hang in there, and I'm going to start breaking this down with an overview. All right, you guys, welcome back. Let's go ahead and get started with this lesson here today on traumatic brain injury. And my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. And my goal here with ICU Advantage is to take these complex critical care topics and really break them down and make them easy to understand for you guys. I really hope that I'm able to do just that. And if I have, hopefully by the end of this lesson, I'll have earned a subscription from you. If you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications. That way you'll never miss out as soon as I release a new lesson. All right, and so let's go ahead and start off talking about traumatic brain injury or something that we refer to as TBI. And so what this is, is essentially when we have some sort of external force that's going to be causing damage to the brain. And this can really be the result of many different types of forces. So things from mechanical, thermal, chemical, electrical, even radiation can technically cause damage to the brain. But more often when we're talking about this, we're referring to the physical mechanical forces. These are the, going to be the most common type. And so our attention has really been brought to TBI over the last decade or so, uh, primarily as a result of some of the sports-related injuries, uh, most notably the, the big NFL controversy, uh, as well as TBI amongst our military, given the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and seeing higher rates of TBI as a result. And so because of these, we've learned quite a lot in regards to this injury. Now, unfortunately, TBI is a very common thing. In fact, the CDC estimates that we have 2.5 million traumatic brain injuries that occur every year in the U.S. alone. And TBI is a major cause of our preventable death and disability within the United States. And in fact, it makes up over 30% of all the injury-related deaths. And really, we estimate that there's probably 50,000 plus deaths per year as a result of this, and half of those are actually dying within the initial two hours after the injury. All right, and so with that said, let's take a quick look at the etiology of this particular brain injury. As I said, all of this is a result of those external forces really being transferred to the brain tissue. So I'm going to take you guys back a little bit to high school physics, and if you remember, we have our equation force equals mass times acceleration. And so logically, we just know that the force that's going to be exerted is going to partially be dependent on the size of the particular object, as well as the acceleration or the speed or sometimes even deceleration in some of our injuries, the speed that something is going. And ultimately, the impact that these forces have are going to be dependent on factors such as the amount of the force, the direction of that force, the duration of the force, as well as the rate and other things like that. And so knowing that we have these different factors that are going to play into the impact of this force, this actually leads pretty nicely into talking about our mechanisms of injury. Now, before I get started here, I really am interested to see what you guys know about this. So head down in the comments below, let me know some examples of different mechanisms of injury that really you guys can think of. Like I said, I'm truly interested to see what you guys know. And then afterwards, let's go ahead and compare answers. All right, so hopefully you took the time to head down there and leave that comment. So let's go ahead and talk about these mechanisms of injury. And there's really two different major types of mechanisms of injury. The first is going to be what we call blunt injury. And the other is going to be penetrating. So first, let's actually talk about our penetrating injuries. So this is going to result when an object actually has penetrated the skull. And these penetrating injuries are most commonly caused by guns, which are our number one most common cause. And this includes both high and low velocity, which will actually have some importance here in just a minute, uh, as well as knives and then other penetrating objects. And these other penetrating objects can really be a whole wide variety of things. I mean, I've seen things from big, long pieces of rebar that have caused injury. I've seen things from rocks being kicked up from a lawnmower, uh, as well as I've even seen things as crazy as like a machete, although I guess that technically could be classified as a knife. 
So again, the key takeaway here is the object is going to penetrate the skull, causing injury to the brain. And so now let's talk about these blunt injuries. And so when we talk about these, these are really going to be resulting from one of the following six reasons. We have our acceleration injury, which is when a moving object makes contact with the head. And this is going to cause acceleration of the head. So here, think baseball bat hitting a head. The next is going to be our deceleration. And so this is where we have a moving head that strikes a stationary object. So here, think of someone who's fallen off a ladder and then hits their head in the process. We also have something that we call acceleration deceleration. And so this is where the brain quickly goes from rest to moving and then back to rest again. And this is really most commonly seen in our motor vehicle accidents. We also have what we call rotation injury. And this is going to be twisting of the brain inside of the skull. This is most commonly caused by some sort of side impact to the head. And then finally, apparently I can't count, this is number five. Finally, we have our compression or deformation. And this is really where we have a change in the shape of the skull that's ultimately causing injury to the brain tissue. And I think this one's pretty self-explanatory here. All right, and so next I want to talk about the different ways in which we classify these brain injuries. And we can really classify these injuries one of two ways. The first is based on the severity, and then the other is going to be based on the pathological features that present. And so if we talk about the severity scale, this is where we're going to see three different severity levels. We have what we call mild, moderate, and severe. And the way that we really grade somebody based on this score is there's a couple different things that we can look at, but the most common of these is going to be to use what we call the Glasgow Coma Scale as our primary assessment tool for classifying the severity of TBI. Now, if you're wondering what the Glasgow Coma Scale is, and you haven't already watched my video that I've already put together on this, I'm actually going to link to that right here, right up above, and head on over and watch that video right now. That way you'll really understand what I'm talking about with this assessment. And so the big takeaway here is the higher GCS score that we have is that's actually going to be associated with better outcomes for our patients. But don't discount the effects of even a mild traumatic brain injury, because even this injury can potentially last a lifetime. Although the majority of people that do have this mild injury will fully recover within just a few weeks. All right, so now if we actually talk about the pathological features as a classification, there's two different types when it comes to classifying this way. And the first of these is what we call focal, and this is where we're going to be producing symptoms that are related to functions of the specific damaged areas. So you can almost think about this as being localized. Now, these particular focal injuries do take up space in the skull, and they ultimately can cause compression of the surrounding tissue, leading to edema, elevated ICPs, brain shifts, and even herniation. So just because they're focal or localized doesn't mean that they can't have an effect on the entire brain. Now, the other classification here is something that we call diffuse. And this is, as the name suggests, it's a widespread injury, uh, often with very little apparent damage on imaging studies. Now, with these injuries, you certainly can have either or, but more common is you're actually going to see both of these in our patients. All right, so let's go ahead and move on from here. And I'm going to talk real quickly about something that we call head injury. This is basically a more broad term and technically does encompass the brain injury that we're going to talk about here in a minute. But things that we also consider a head injury that we don't consider brain injury are going to be things like a scalp injury and our skull fractures. Now for a scalp injury, this is where we're going to have things like an abrasion, which is going to be that top layer of skin that's removed with maybe a little bit of bleeding, to a contusion, which is the skin isn't broken and we have a hematoma, and then finally a laceration in which we have the scalp which is actually torn. Now, the scalp is well supplied with blood, so if you do see a scalp laceration, you truly might have extensive bleeding and is probably going to require some sort of suturing. Now, when it comes to skull fractures, there's actually four, and I believe I can count this time, there's four different skull fractures that we're going to talk about. The first is going to be our linear fracture, where this is essentially just a single fracture line or a crack in the bone. So next is going to be our comminuted. This is basically splintered and shattered into pieces. Next is going to be the depressed skull fracture, which actually goes in line with what we had talked about previously with the mechanism of injury being that compression or deformation. 
So in the depressed skull fracture, we're going to have bone fragments that become inwardly depressed into the brain tissue. And this can either be open or closed. And then finally, the last fracture is going to be something that we call the basilar, which is essentially a linear fracture along the base of the skull. Now, our basal skull fracture, this is where you're going to see some of these classic signs like, like our periorbital ecchymosis, or something we call raccoon eyes, the mastoid ecchymosis, or battle sign. You can also have a dural tear resulting in either rhinorrhea, which is CSF or blood from the nose, or otorrhea, which is CSF or blood from the ears, as well as the hemotympanum, which is where we have blood in the tympanic cavity behind that tympanic membrane. All right, so with those out of the way, let's actually get in and start to talk about our brain injuries and specifically something that we refer to as our primary brain injury. Now, this is going to be a really quick overview as I'm actually going to have another lesson coming up here where I'm going to cover this stuff in much more depth. But our primary brain injury is going to be something that occurs at the time of the impact and the result is either a focal, diffuse, or combination of the two injury. There's actually seven different types of primary brain injury that I'm going to talk about. So the first and the least severe is going to be our concussion. And this is essentially our mildest form. Uh, really, this is considered a diffuse injury. And someone with a concussion can often have a brief loss of consciousness, a headache, dizziness, and possibly nausea and vomiting. All right, next is going to be something that we call a contusion. This is where we're going to have small bleeds or bruising in the brain tissue. Now this is where we can start to see things like coup versus counter coup, which is essentially seeing injury on the same, which is coup, or the opposite side, which is counter coup, of the impact. Symptoms that you can see with this are going to be changes in our patient's level of consciousness. You can have central nervous system dysfunction, seizures, uh, hemiparesis, hemiplegia, really kind of dependent on where this particular focal injury is occurring. All right, the next injury that I'm going to talk about is something that we call uh, epidural hematoma. And this is where we have bleeding between the dura mater and the skull. And this one's often associated with skull fractures. Now, the epidural hematomas are usually the result of an arterial bleed, uh, most associated with the middle meningeal artery that's located right under the temporal bone. But sort of our classic presentation for this, and certainly not everybody goes through this, is you may see somebody who presented with an initial loss of consciousness, but then regained consciousness for this period of time, something that we call the lucid period, followed by a pretty rapid decline in their condition. And that rapid decline is really a result of that fast bleeding hematoma since it's an arterial bleed. Now again, some of the symptoms that we can see for this are again changes in our patient's level of consciousness, headache, seizure, vomiting, and then again, focal changes, and in particular, we could see ipsilateral pupil dilation. So here, this hematoma is putting pressure on the brain tissue, causing this mass effect and elevating our patient's ICP. And in almost all cases, this is going to require emergent surgery for this hematoma. All right, so now let's talk about a subdural hematoma. And this is where we're going to see bleeding that's between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. Now, the subdural hematoma is going to be a little bit different because this is going to be the result of shearing of these cortical veins that kind of bridge between the dura and the arachnoid. So typically, these are going to be the result of an acceleration, deceleration, or some sort of rotational injury. So if you think about it here, now we're actually dealing with a venous bleed as opposed to that arterial bleed. Now, essentially, we're going to classify these as either acute versus subacute and chronic based on if symptoms are going to be present within the first 48 hours. Most often, these are going to occur a lot sooner than that. Now, here in these patients, we're going to see this progressive decline in their level of consciousness. They could have a headache, agitation, confusion, seizures, and once again, focal deficits depending on where the bleed is. And again, here think the symptoms are usually going to develop slowly as a result of that slower venous bleed. Now again, depending on the impact that this is having on our patient, that this could also require potentially emergent surgery or at a minimum some sort of drain placement. All right, so the next bleed that I'm going to talk about here is something that we call the traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is where we're going to have bleeding that's below the subarachnoid membrane in the subarachnoid space, but it's still outside of the brain tissue. 
Now, this is actually going to be pathologically different than a subarachnoid hemorrhage that we see as a result of an aneurysm rupture. Uh, and in the case of these traumatic ones, there often isn't any surgical intervention that can be done. Now, if we do see a decreased level of conscious in our trauma patients, uh, that this is actually going to be associated with a poor prognosis. And given the nature of the space in which this bleeding is, that this may also present itself with an intraventricular hemorrhage as well. Now, for these patients, the symptoms that we're going to see are changes in level of consciousness, a headache, which is often described as the worst headache of their life, uh, confusion, seizures, and once again, focal deficits. All right, and the next bleed that I'm going to talk about is something that we call our intracerebral hemorrhage. And this is where we have bleeding in the actual parenchymal tissue of the brain. Now, this bleeding can occur in a lot of different places throughout the brain, depending where the particular vessel is that's injured. But it's important to know that this is not to be confused with the intraparenchymal hemorrhage, or IPH, which is the result of a non-traumatic bleed inside the parenchyma. Now, this bleed is usually associated with severe acceleration, deceleration injuries or penetrating injuries. And the symptoms that we'll see here with this is, once again, changes in our level of consciousness, headache, focal deficits, as well as an elevated ICP. All right, and then finally, the last injury that I want to talk about is something that we call our diffuse injury. And this is really something that exists on a continuum of severity from concussion being our least severe diffuse injury all the way up to something that we call diffuse axonal injury or DAI. And essentially in the case of DAI, this is where we just have this diffuse injury, this diffuse shearing of these axons. And then these patients are going to present with the loss of consciousness and coma and abnormal posturing. And again, as I had mentioned earlier, oftentimes these are going to appear normal on the CT. And if anything, you just might see this diffuse edema as a result. So our patient's prognosis is really going to be based on the severity of this injury. Although for our really severe cases, the prognosis is really poor. All right, so those are different types of primary brain injuries. Next, I want to just move on and talk about real quickly something that we call our secondary brain injury. Now, again, this is going to be a very quick overview, uh, as again, I'm going to do another lesson specifically looking at these secondary brain injuries more in depth, uh, really when I'm talking about the management of brain injury. But essentially, the secondary brain injury is a continuation of damage to the brain that is as a result of physiological effects from the primary brain injury. And so basically what's happening here is the primary brain injury is going to lead to this cascade of ischemia and cellular level changes that are going to lead to additional neuron cell injury and ultimately cell death. And some of the major contributors to this are going to be things like hypoxemia, hypotension, anemia, uh, increased intracranial pressures, uh, impaired autoregulation, either hypo or hypercapnia, uh, same thing, either hypo or hyperglycemia, uh, various biochemical changes that are taking place, uh, as well as our patient's metabolic demand. And so ultimately, when it comes to the management of these patients, that this is going to revolve around minimizing these secondary injuries, uh, ultimately by increasing the cerebral oxygen delivery to the brain and decreasing the cerebral metabolic demand. All right, and with that said, that's going to wrap things up here. I hope this lesson was very beneficial to you guys. Like I said, this was a quick overview. Make sure you guys are keeping an eye out for those future lessons where we're going to go over some of the stuff more in depth here. Again, if you enjoyed this lesson, make sure and subscribe to the channel uh, as well as leave me a like. It really goes a long way to help support this channel. And while you're waiting for those next lessons, make sure and check out this awesome lesson that YouTube's recommending for you right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching and you have a great day.